All right, I wanna welcome everyone to the Parrot Club's May 2022 meeting. Tonight, we're very excited to have Fabio Tarazona with us. Fabio is a field biologist with a strong passion for avian conservation. He's currently working towards a PhD at the University of Miami under the mentorship of Dr. Mauro Galetti. Fabio has vast experience in the field of conservation biology, having worked and directly led several research projects, which has spanned from evaluating nest survival of avian communities in the Chihuahuan Desert of New Mexico to evaluating the impacts of nest poaching of endangered neotropical parrots in Central America. So the Caribbean islands have experienced severe human-related extinctions in the last 7,000 years, but we lack a full understanding of the effects of these extinctions on the function of the ecosystem. All species of primates, giant sloths, macaws, and giant tortoises have gone extinct in the Caribbean. In particular, the islands have experienced a strong loss of animals that eat and disperse seeded plants, such as parrots. And Fabio will talk about the importance of birds and reptiles for endangered plant life in the islands and his exciting work on how rewilding animals, especially macaws, can restore the ecology. He will also discuss his previous research in Belize with yellow-headed Amazons on nest survival and nest box selection. So I'll turn it over to you now, Fabio. Thank you for coming. You're most welcome. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, so as Amy just mentioned today, I'll be talking, let me start sharing my screen so that we can uh, start seeing the slides here. So as Amy just mentioned, uh, Amy, could you let me know if you can see my before, I'm gonna put it on presenter view on my end. Can you see the slides or my notes? Yes, I can, just the slides. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so as Amy mentioned, uh, most of the work I've done before has been focusing on nest survival of yellow-headed Amazons in uh, Belize. Specifically, we're pretty interested in this endangered species. And uh, particularly in terms of management implications, how can we manage these populations to reduce the threat of, of uh, nest poaching for them? And so this leads to uh, basically a phenomenon called defaunation in which the removal of, of some of these species from the ecosystem leads to a trophic cascade uh, of another set of, um, um, it, it disrupts the ecosystem stability. So we're pretty interested in, in seeing how the removal of some of these species, not, not we're not purposely removing these species, but through the effects of uh, either poaching or hunting or habitat destruction, what is the effect on local plant communities on that? So I'll start my talk by uh, telling you about the research I've done in the past, uh, looking at survival of yellowheads in, in Belize and poaching, and then translate into what we're doing now in the Caribbean. So starting broadly, and of course, this is a parrot loving audience. So just a couple of quick facts for you guys. Uh, there's roughly 392 species of parrots. This number goes up and down depending on taxonomic uh, classifications. But as a whole, most parrots are characterized by having long lifespans and high adult survival and low reproductive rates. So these guys are in no rush in any given year to basically produce young uh, because they know that in the next year, they're probably still gonna be alive and they're gonna have the opportunity to reproduce again. So this comes with a series of, um, of challenges when you're managing these populations. Now, unfortunately, uh, the most of these wild populations are under severe threat and 28% of the parrot species around the globe are, are already under some level of threat. So that brings us to the question that we need to start assessing what are the factors affecting nest survival where the next generation of parrots is being produced. And unfortunately, one of the most common, uh, one of the most common threats comes from nest poaching of wild populations in which uh, this is a major so source of threat for neotropical parrots, and it's roughly affecting 98% of the, of the popu parrot populations in the neotropics. Now, the effect of poaching comes, uh, there's two main effects of poaching. One of them is pretty direct, in which the next generation of chicks is removed from the nest. Uh, this is an example from Belize. This is where some um, birds that we saw in the field that have been recently poached and we're now being sold uh, 
basically by the street. So these are uh, three chicks of yellow-headed Amazons. And now the second threat that poaching brings is the destruction of nesting sites. As most of us know, parrots are uh, completely dependent on the existence of nesting cavities on, on trees. And one very common uh, method of removing the chicks is basically either by opening um, an additional uh, cavity under the main one, or just by removing, cutting down the entire tree, as we can see on the picture uh, to the right. So these were the nest, this was the nest originally. Uh, on a given year, the poacher came over and opened a new cavity because he couldn't reach the chicks. And eventually it just decided to cut down the entire tree. And as we can imagine, this has a direct effect on the next year because those parts are probably not gonna have a space where they can breed. So looking at the sort of the consumer side of the equation, we already know that there's a preference for larger parrot species that have a brighter coloration and are able to mimic human speech. And that introduces us to the main, one of the main characters in our story today, the yellow-headed Amazon. And as we can see from this picture, these are wild birds in Belize, but we can see that they're kind of on the bigger end of the spectrum for Amazon parrots and they have a very bright yellow coloration on the head, making them particularly attractive. Um, and just to put the cherry on top, as we know, if we have any back at home, uh, they're really, really good at mimicking human speech. So they're pretty good talkers and that makes them very sought after for the illegal pet trade uh, in Belize. So just to give you more information on our study species, we're focusing on the Belizean subspecies, Amazona auratrix belizensis, and as a whole, the species, the species is considered to be under the IUCN red list, which means that they're basically endangered across their distribution. Uh, past estimates from around 1994 uh, estimated that the population was around 7,000 individuals. These numbers have not really been updated since, but we know that the species is endemic to the Mesoamerican region occurring in Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. And some of the previous work that we had done in the past, we started working with the species in 2015, already suggests that Belize is holding the largest species, the largest density of yellow-headed Amazons across the distribution. So that makes it a very, uh, basically an ideal country for us to start our research. So the main focus of our research was basically to um, study what was happening at the nest level, as I mentioned before, what were the main threats that um, could affect the survival of that next generation of parrots. And to do that, we had a total of five study sites distributed across the country, uh, roughly divided by Northern um, and Southern uh, pine savanna. So the species in Belize occurs only in the pine savanna. So that's where we focus most of our activities. And within each of these sites, we had very, very technical and very high technology science. We were, basically just cruising around our old Jeep with our old Jeep uh, carrying a bunch of binoculars and some observers uh, kind of looking around for any type of potential activity, any type of parrot activity in the earth. So very low tech, uh, but very intense of, uh, in terms of the amount of field work that we were doing. And if we were lucky, we would encounter something like this. And, uh, I'll try not to speak over the uh, over the uh, video, so I'll, I'll keep my comments towards the end. But basically, this is the type of behavior that we were looking for. So I don't know if you could hear in the back, but there's another call, another bird calling back to this individual. So that gives us a pretty good indication that we're, we're talking about a, a mated pair here. And as you can see, this is the female actually in the video. She did not fly away when we approached her, uh, which suggests that she has some, she, there's something keeping her there. And if you look hard enough, you eventually find something like this. The beauty of a, of a female basically coming out of its natural cavity. Uh, and that basically is the, the best indication that they're breeding in the area. So once we were able to confirm that there were uh, natural cavities in the area and th those were being used, we climbed them. And again, if we were really lucky, we would find something like this in which as we can see, uh, we either found uh, an, a female incubating its eggs or newly hatched chicks, 
or uh, chicks that were sort of the, on the older uh, side of the spectrum. Now for each of these nests, we installed either a camera what we see here on the left side is a, is a field camera that was triggered by any type of uh, motion or uh, what we call a temperature data logger. So we were interested in monitoring the, uh, the uh, temperature inside the nest to see if that was actually triggering any type of abandonment. Our hypothesis was that if those nests were increased, the, the temperature within those nests was increasing too much, then that would lead to abandonment. For the purposes of today, given the time restrictions, I'm only gonna be talking about uh, predation and poaching, but I'll be happy to discuss any of our abandonment findings uh, uh, if there are any questions later on. So what did our field efforts um, tell us? Well, we found a total of 124 nests between two years, that was 2018 and 2019. And out of 124, roughly 40 of them were uh, successful in fledging any chick. So uh, in producing at least one chick. We also found that predation was the main cause of abandonment uh, of failure with roughly 44 uh, out of the 124 nests failing due to predation with this was roughly 34% of those. Then followed by abandonment with roughly 20, 23 nests and lastly by poaching. I should have also mentioned that we're seeing uh, sort of lower numbers of poaching, but we were only working in areas that were officially designated as protected areas. So there was already some type of protection either on paper or in the field with uh, direct uh, park rangers protecting these areas. So we expect that the poaching uh, threat is sort of larger than what we're seeing here. Now, in terms of the timing of these activities, this is uh, one of the main findings, actually. As we can see here, we have a graph. And on the x-axis, we have dates. So this is basically the duration of the breeding season for the species in Belize, which ranges from uh, the beginning of March all the way into July. And then what we have on the y-axis is the, the cumulative number of failed nests for each of the fates that we were studying. So the blue line represents predation, the black line represents abandonment, and then the gray line represents poaching. And as we can see here, these lines don't really overlap with each other, and there's sort of a separation between them. So as we can see, predation and abandonment were sort of starting to happen towards the um, earlier in the season, while poaching was happening later on, roughly in April and May. And we'll come back to this point uh, later on in the talk. So one of the main findings specifically for predation was that the age of the nest was one of the best predictors of survival for that nest. So again, what we have here on the x-axis is the age of the nest in terms of days from zero to 88 days, which was the nesting period for the species. And what we have on the y-axis is the predicted survival probability. And as we can see here, this line is pretty positive. So basically as the age of that nest increases, the survival probability increases as well. So this all makes sense uh, when I'm explaining and you can see the plot, but when you actually see it, that's when it really clicks. So basically these younger chicks over here would look somewhat like this, in which they're completely naked, uh, begging loudly for their parents and basically don't have any ability to thermoregulate at this point. So they're pretty um, at the mercy of any predator or the elements. And they would sound somewhat like this. And sadly, as you can expect, this smaller chick that's being loud and has no, really no way to defend itself, sort of ended like this, where predation again was one of the main causes of failure, particularly for some of the smaller chicks. Now, as the season progresses and as those nests are able to uh, survive those initial stages and reach into the older, uh, uh, transitioning to older chicks, they look and sound somewhat like this. And just to give you a heads up, it's a little loud, so. So as you can imagine, 
basically if you're a predator or a snake or any any uh, woodpeckers were also one of the main predators for us if you come into a nest and you find these two um, grumpy things uh, barking at you you're more than likely to just fly away and call it a day and be like nope this is not for me. So this aligns very nicely with the prediction that we saw earlier that older, some of those older nests were more than likely to survive. And as you can imagine, on my end as the researcher, dealing with these chicks was not as friendly uh, for my hands as it was for the, uh, for the younger chick that we see on the left. Now, when we look at poaching, we also find a very interesting uh, pattern here in which the best predictors were basically the distance of the nest to any type of human settlement and also the day of the season. So specifically for, for settlements, we have here um, the distance in kilometers from one to all the way to 12 kilometers to the nearest, basically the nearest house. And then on the y-axis, we again, we have the predicted survival probability. And as we can see here, as the distance uh, to the nearest house or the nearest settlement increases, the survival probability increases as well. And that makes sense, right? We're all, we're humans, we're lazy, we like things the easy way. So it makes sense for these nest poachers to sort of focus to whatever is available that's closest to themselves. Um, to themselves. And then in terms of the timing of these events, uh, again, we have on the x-axis the day of the season from March all the way into July, and then on the y-axis the predicted survival probability. And as we can see here, we start with a very high survival probability, close to one, so basically close to 100%. And then as the season progresses, our survival probability starts to go down roughly in April and May, and we'd reach its lowest point roughly by the 10th of May before it starts going up again. So towards the end of the season, the survival probability goes, goes back up to roughly 100%. So there are two main things that are happening during this critical period here uh, in which the nestlings are getting poached. And that is, number one, it's, uh, it's the peak of the dry season. So the accessibility to these areas is basically at its highest point. Uh, we're working with seasonally flooded savannas, so once the rains come in, they are no joke. They're coming in for real. You can't use any type of motor vehicle to access them. Accessing by uh, on foot is basically impossible, no bicycles. So you have a very limited window of opportunity to go into these natural areas and take the chicks before the rains come. And then the second thing that's happening during the month, the month of May is that the chicks are reaching the pre-fledgling stage. So they're not too young, as we saw earlier on the naked little chick, but they're also not too old and grumpy, as we saw on the older chicks. So they're kind of in that in-between stage in which they're just flock, um, um, little, fat, uh, little fat naked nestlings where you can take them and they're not going to be acting as aggressive as some of the older chicks. And another thing that's happening is we, I'm going to direct your attention to panel C over here. And this is basically the weight gain of nestlings across their, uh, across their age. And as we can see here in that in-between stage, the weight is, is reaching its highest point before they actually leave the nest and the weight starts to go down again. So once again, the poachers are taking them in that in-between stage in, where, in which they're at their highest point in terms of weight. And when you look at that in the field, that makes a lot of sense because again, it's easy money for these people. So they're not investing a lot of money in terms of keeping them in good conditions. You wanna get a chick that's fat, that you can sell quickly and that's able to sustain the rough conditions in which they're kept. So when you pull all of these sources of threat together, uh, the poaching, the predation and the abandonment, what do you end up with? Well, unfortunately, the survival probability for these species is relatively low in the field. So the probability of making it from egg all the way into a, basically a pre-fledgling chick and being able to survive the threat of uh, predation and poaching uh, is basically only 17%. So only 17% of those nests are able to make it from egg all the way into a, a fledgling chick. 
and this poacher uh, was basically caught in the act. <laughs> that's a that's a picture of myself, uh, but I'm using it to denote uh, the act of poaching here. So keeping this in mind, we came up with a couple of management recommendations for the local agencies that are trying to protect these. So the first one is, of course, increase dust protection efforts and specifically focus those efforts during the months of April and May and also focus on those nests that are closest to any type of human settlement. As we remember earlier in the presentation, one of the main threats from poaching came from the destruction of nesting sites. So one of the um, management recommendations that we suggested was to um, either supplement with nest boxes or restore the dimensions of previously poached cavities, as has been done in Venezuela with the yellow-shouldered Amazons, where, as we can see here, the direct, the original entrance of the um, nest was right here, and this was the entrance that was opened by a poacher. So basically, if you're able to increase your protection efforts and restore the dimensions of those cavities, then the parrots are more than likely to come back and continue using those historical nesting sites. So that's sort of in a nutshell what we were able to do in Belize. And my interest after noticing the effects of poaching and removing some of these birds from their natural areas sort of shifted into what is actually happening on the bigger scale on the ecosystem? What, what are the ecological consequences of removing some of these species, again, either by poaching, habitat destruction, and how, are, uh, how is the, uh, the ecosystem responding to that? And specifically, how are plants, uh, plant communities responding to that? So that brings us to the second half of our talk, our talk for today, Rewilding the Caribbean where I'm currently working on the, under the mentorship of Dr. Mauro Galetti. And one of his main interests, again, has been, work, have, has been looking at the effect of, of defaunation, of remover, some, removing some of these larger species from the ecosystem. Now, today I'll be talking specifically uh, about the Caribbean, but he has done ample work in specifically in the, uh, in, in the um, Atlantic uh, forests in Brazil. And he has found many, many interactions in which once you start removing some of the larger key components, such as the uh, tapirs, the hyacinth macaws, the toucans, the plants basically, number one, they're not as successful in dispersing themselves, their seeds. Uh, no one is able to consume some of those larger seeds. So they, the larger plants are not able to colonize new areas. And number two, the, the carbon storage capacity of the forest starts to go down. There's a positive relationship with um, seed size and the carbon storage capacity of the trees. So as you can imagine, once you start removing those animals that consume the larger seeds, then the, the, the carbon storage capacity starts to go down. So again, uh, focusing into the Caribbean, I am here roughly, uh, we're at University of Miami, which is this red dot over here. And as we can see, our next door neighbor, if we get on a plane or a boat, is the Caribbean. And it's roughly composed of a thousand islands, keys or atolls, and we're, many of us are familiar with the beautiful scenery here, with the beautiful beaches and the lush uh, green vegetation present in many of these islands. Now, roughly about 7,000 years ago, uh, there were several colonization events uh, from humans, and this came from South America. And roughly by the end of the 1400s, there was a second colonization event, uh, basically by the Spanish um, colonizing the, the uh, Greater and Lesser Antilles. And maybe what they found that in that time was somewhat like this, in which the forests and ma in many of the islands were composed uh, species inhabiting them were, were similar to this, in which we had species such as giant sloths and also monkeys in our islands like Cuba and Jamaica. And those, of course, had their respective ecological roles consuming some of those larger fruits. Now, not only that, but many of the islands in the Caribbean had their own species of macaws and larger parrots, as we can see here from the uh, extinct Cuban macaw. And the image would have looked somewhat like this, in which as we can see, there's a large diversity of birds and tortoises in the background, but unfortunately the human effects 
are already made, making themselves known in which larger species such as the tortoises were widely consumed for their meat and basically because they were easy to catch. Now these effects lead to what we know today, the Caribbean kind of looks somewhat like this in which we unfortunately now have the effects of exotic species as is the case of feral pigs in the Bahamas. Um, things like horses around natural nesting areas of, of um, uh, sea turtles and coral reefs, and also the effects of, of the large scale effect of tourism uh, from cruise ships. So again, looking, looking back, what did these islands look like in terms of their fauna and the uh, abundance throughout the Caribbean? So starting with the larger reptiles, the larger tortoises, we can see here that Basically, each of these islands had their own species of tortoise. Uh, as we can see, Cuba, the Bahamas, Española, and even all the way down into the Lesser Antilles. And the um, islands uh, north of South America, the Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao, each of these had their own species of tortoise. And, and we're talking about tortoises the, the size of the Galapagos tortoises that many of us have seen. And each of, the, each of these was having their own ecological role within, within each of those islands. In terms of the macaws, there were roughly between 11 and 13 species of macaws present throughout the Caribbean. And it, once again, we can see that they're present in Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, and even the Lesser Antilles uh, as well. And unfortunately, all of these species are now extinct. Uh, we're only familiar with them from fossil records and some of the uh, extant pirate species are sort of on the smaller end of the spectrum. Now, another key player here are the iguanas, the ciclura iguanas, and there's a vast variety of ciclura iguanas present in the Caribbean, with sort of the most well-known one being the uh, ciclura cornuta, as we can see here on the middle picture. But many of these, uh, ciclura iguanas, unfortunately, given their beautiful coloration, as we can see from the Bahamian ciclura or the spotted ciclura over here, are now heavily sought for the pet trade. And historically, the populations would have looked somewhat like this, in which, once again, the same pattern repeats itself. Many of these islands have their own ciclura iguanas. And now, on present day, uh, for example, in the Lesser Antilles, only two of the islands have remaining iguana populations. The iguana, the ciclura iguana in Puerto Rico is uh, basically extinct, only found in one small key on the west side of the island. And on the other islands that uh, still have iguanas, the population are either critically endangered or they have been reduced to very small, um, small pockets uh, within what was usually their historical distribution. So that then brings us to the question, what are the living frugivores then for the Caribbean? Well, they look somewhat like this, in which most of them are composed of birds, and more, most of them are sort of on the medium size or, or the smaller side of the spectrum, with some of the larger frugivores being composed of basically uh, parrots, as we can see here from the uh, picture of the, of the Cuban Amazon, or pigeons, as we can see by the white crowned pigeon. However, once you remove those larger frugivores, your picture looks somewhat like this, in which most of the frugivores start looking like, uh, like mockingbirds, so roughly the size of a mockingbird. And as you can imagine, that has uh, impacts on the probability of, of, of fruits being consumed and being able to be dispersed successfully. So that brings us to the main project, the main project that we're working on, I'm working as part of my PhD and Mauro is supervising as well. And the idea behind it is that before the defaunation events, the ecosystem would have looked somewhat like this, in which we have fruiting trees that are larger fruiting trees that are widely consumed by a diverse variety of species, either by tortoises or flying bats or some um, birds that are on the flying and uh, larger end of the spectrum. And each of these species is moving within, within the islands. And with that, they're also moving the seeds, allowing for new colonization of habitats. Now, unfortunately, after the defaunation events, you end up with somewhat like this, in which the fruits are still there and the trees are still there. But unfortunately, many of those larger frugivores and larger disperses are no longer there. And therefore, the probability of these fruits reaching a new area 
becomes close to zero. So that would look somewhat like this, in which our idea is that these larger communities of tortoise, extinct tortoises, or reduced populations of iguanas and, and pigeons would have promoted large diversity of plant communities by consuming some of the larger fruits, as we can see from the tortoise, and promoting uh, uh, differences in terms of structure, in which we have uh, large, uh, large fruiting trees promote, uh, contributing to the population, and also younger trees that are replacing some of those larger trees. And the idea, unfortunately, is that now, given the effects of defaunation, we no longer have these communities, and that in turn leads to a less diverse uh, community. So to answer some of these questions, we've actually gone into the field and we've started doing some sort of laying the ground to what is to come. So we've, starting, we've started collecting different types of fruits, all from the Caribbean, and measuring their characteristics. And as we can see, there is a large variety of fruits, some, uh, some on the larger end of the spectrum, as we can see here from Matawei and Goetza over here on the right. And then we also find the typical berry shaped or colored fruit, which is typically dispersed by, by some of the smaller birds present. And unfortunately, the question now remains is who is dispersing, who is dispersing this larger, uh, larger fruits? And many, what we have found is that many of the fruits are act now actually look like this, in which they're on the smaller end of the spectrum. And what we think is that plants are adapting by reducing the, side, the size of the seeds and fruits so that smaller birds are able to consume them. So then the question is, how are these larger fruited species responding to these defaunation events? Um, and what can we do about it? So what we have started doing for that is that we've, we've gone into the field and we've started collecting data on the size uh, of the, on the size of the fruits. So basically we started measuring the uh, length, the width and the weight of the, uh, of the fruit and also the same type of measurements for the, uh, for the seeds themselves. And then we pair that with, with the gape size of the existing frugivores. So by gape, I basically mean the width of the mouth of the frugivores. So what we can start doing is that if we know that this plant here, the fruits on this plant measure roughly 15 millimeters, and we found we find that the gape of this bird is also 15 millimeters, then we can start matching who eats what. And we already, we would know based on these measurements that anything that's 15 milli millimeters or above would not be able to be dispersed by some of the existing frugivores in the system. So again, uh, to give you a summary of what we have uh, being able to reach so far, we've collected roughly uh, 1,985 individual birds. Um, and out of these, we have roughly 30, uh, 305 species represented here. So we're, we're, we're doing pretty good. Uh, as we can see here on the uh, phylogenetic tree. So basically the way to read this is that each of these terminal ends right here represents an individual species. And the color, the blue colors represent species that we have already collected data for, and the red species represent spe uh, are species that we have not been able to collect data for. So as we can see, we have almost have the entire avian, um, avian system of the Caribbean represented in our data so far. Now, in terms of plants, uh, what we have, uh, we're not doing as well as with the, uh, with the rest of the frugivores, but we see that there's a vast variety of, in terms of color, uh, shape, and, and, and size of the, of the fruits that we have collected so far. And we've been able to collect around 5,000 uh, 5, individuals uh, of fleshy fruits for the Caribbean. So we, we're getting a pretty good idea of what does that uh, landscape of shape and size look for the fruits in the Caribbean. And we, so far we have 184 uh, species. So the goal is to reach at least 250 species before we can start uh, pairing these interactions with one another. Now, as you remember uh, from a couple slides ago, one of the main interests for us was measuring the gape size of those uh, avian frugivores. And what we see here on the x-axis, what we have is the uh, gape size in millimeters. 
And on the y-axis, we have the density of measurement. So basically the idea here is that if the plot is closer, it's kind of shifting towards the right end of the, of the graph, then we're looking at a larger frugivore that's able to consume some of the larger fruits. And as we can see, many of the frugivores in the Caribbean are sort of on the opposite side. They're on the left side of the plot, meaning that they can only consume some of this, um, the smaller fruits in the, in the landscape. Well, we see here that parrots are shifting into the right and the same goes for cuckoo birds and trogons. Now, unfortunately, cuckoos and trogons, um, the vast variety, the majority of their data is not really, uh, of their diet, I'm sorry, is not really composed of uh, fruits themselves. They, they rely more on insects. So as we can see, parrots are then taking over that role of consuming some of those larger fruits and seeds for the Caribbean at least. And then when we when we look at these interactions throughout the entire uh, frugivores, so we, when we consider reptiles, uh, tortoises, reptiles, and uh, birds, we see again that the the tortoises are occupying sort of the larger spectrum, followed by the reptiles, and then the birds are shifting more into the the smaller size of the spectrum. So what we see here is that some of the fruits are on the some of the smaller, some of these larger fruits are on the right-hand side of the spectrum. Are these? These are the fruits that are not really able to be consumed by any of the uh, any of the existing um, birds in the ecosystem. So again, that brings us back to uh, parrots. And as many of us know, parrots are excellent at being very messy when they eat. They're able to pick something here and then grab it with their beak or with their feet and just carry it away and send, take it somewhere else. So these are a couple of examples from Puerto Rican parrots in which, as we can see here, they're consuming palm fruits. And even this guy over here, is, it's taking the palm seeds away from the mother tree and basically dispersing it into a, a new area, which, which would not be able to be accomplished by any of the other frugivores. And jumping into uh, macaws, we see the same pattern in which some of, uh, some of these larger frugivores are able to consume these fruits and carry them around in their beaks or in their, uh, in their legs. So, so they're kind of the best proxy that we have for what the Caribbean used to be. As we can see here from the hyacinth carrying this larger fruit here. And I think these are uh, chestnut fronted macaws in Bolivia. Uh, carrying again some of the larger pods in, in their beaks. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the uh, we're in Miami and there, we have a vast variety of introduced parrots here. And that brings us the opportunity to start testing some of these ideas uh, either with uh, some of the native uh, on the of the introduced parrots that we have and also on the uh, reptiles as well. So one of the species that we started using for our studies, is the chestnut fronted macaws. And as we can see here, they're, they're pretty abundant in South Florida. And we've also started using uh, um, Galapagos tortoises in local private collections. So the, we're using these two guys as well as blue and yellow macaws to start feeding them some of those larger fruits in the Caribbean to see how their manipulation and their consumption would affect their colonization rates. And this is this is actually a pretty pretty exciting stuff that we've started doing with with the feral wild macaws here in Miami. I've started uh, giving them some of the wild fruits in the Caribbean, and what we have found is that they're pretty picky eaters, as we can see from this pic this video. So I was hoping that it would then go into, and these are the the green the green circular fruits are the ones that I put out for them as you and as you saw it basically just grabbed one and did not want anything to do with it. So we're they're, be, they're being very picky eaters, but when it comes to palm seeds, they simply cannot resist themselves. And as we can see here, this is what the uh, what the palm fruits would have looked like before the actual consumption uh, by the macaws. 
And after they use them, they eat them. Uh, it looks somewhat like this in which the uh, shell is completely removed and the flesh is removed as well, leaving you with a pretty clean uh, seed that you can then take and take over and, and, and plant and measure the germination rates. So we've, we're accomplishing this with a, with a beautiful collaboration with Ms. Daria Feinstein, who has uh, a local feeder uh, for macaws in her, in her yard. And the wild birds basically visit her on a daily basis. So we go out there and put out, um, we put out natural fruits from the Caribbean for them. And then we measure whether or not they consume them and how that affects the germination rates for some of these plants. I've repeated the same thing for um, Amazon parrots in Puerto Rico. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. So I'm using the species back home to see how that affects the germination rates. And so far the results are very promising. We have here pictures of the before and after consumption. So these are palm seeds. Uh, as we can see, they basically give you um, give you the completely clean uh, seed after they consume them. The same thing goes for um, the Matawei seeds over here. They remove uh, the um, they remove all of the pulp and just give you the naked seed afterwards. And the same thing goes for uh, the Pouteria flower, the Pouteria fruits as well. So they're really good at cleaning up all of those seeds and basically dropping them off in the forest. And that we think has an effect on germination. And we'll see that in, 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 a, in, a, in a little while in the presentation. Now, again, as you'll remember, we're also considering the effects of extinct tortoises as well. So what what we are, we're repeating the same study by basically feeding them with some of the larger species of fruits uh, found in the Caribbean. And one of my colleagues then has the uh, smelly task of finding their feces and inspecting them for seeds. And as we can see, they basically digest all of the fruit, all of the uh, flesh of the fruits and give you some very, very smelly, but, but um, deep pulp seeds afterwards. And we'll see the same thing here in which this is the seed before being consumed. And afterwards we see that all of that external meat is removed and you end up with a smooth surface that um, basically we believe affects the germination rate of some of these plants. And we've actually started testing that in, in, in the field, uh, not in the field, but in the greenhouse where we have different treatment effects for each of those frugivores. So we have plant, we have seeds here that are consumed by um, macaws, seeds that are consumed by iguanas and by giant tortoises. And what we found is that the germination rate for some of these species is basically re reduced by more than half after the macaws, tortoises and iguanas consume them. In some of these cases, uh, we have palm fruits that some of the collectors had told us that it had taken them up to two years to germinate. And after consumption by the uh, macaws, tortoises, and iguanas, we had them germinating in roughly six months. So the effect of these frugivores is pretty, uh, is pretty strong on these species. And again, the germination vigor is also in increased. So we're, what we're seeing is that these seeds are germinating pretty much stronger than if, if we were just trying to germinate them with, without the effect of the uh, of the frugivore. So we believe that uh, basically in their feces, the increased amount of nitrogen uh, basically gives them a little booster to, uh, to, to start growing faster. So keeping these questions in mind, what are, what are then the next steps? Um, again, we're kind of laying the ground here. We're investigating what are, what are some of the loss interactions here. And on the long run, the idea is to demonstrate how the removal of these species is affecting the colonization rates by, um, uh, by, the, by the plant species in the Caribbean. So we could start thinking of re the idea of rewilding the Caribbean. Um, and how could we do that? We could do that by uh, returning some of those natural interactions to the Caribbean, either by uh, protecting the current species, as, as we saw the current uh, Ciclura iguanas from the threats of poaching and, and uh, habitat destruction and protection of native parrots, uh, native parrots as well. Now, for some of these larger species, should we start thinking 
of perhaps introducing species that were similar in size to the extinct macaws, as is the case for the golden for the uh, chestnut-fronted macaws. Of course, this, this gets very technical when you start introducing new species into areas, but these are some of the ideas that we're trying to explore with the type of research that we're doing. This also has vast implications for the uh, avail the ability for, for plants to escape the climate, the threats of climate change and rising sea levels, because when you remove, when you remove those dispersers, um, basically the plant has nowhere to go. And if you, if you start bringing some of those interactions back by re, um, reintroducing some of these larger frugivores, you're more than likely to give these plants a quick chance to adapt to the, to the new and changing conditions. So that's um, sort of the background information that I had for today. Before we finalize the talk and, and sort of uh, start going into questions, um, I wanted to, um, Give a quick shout out to one of the um, uh, one of the really exciting and new project that we've started, uh, where we found we're looking actively looking and, and um, monitoring uh, wild macaw nests here in Miami, and we have set up uh, basically sort of a spy camera so that we can uh, have a live broadcast of the macaw activities within the nest. So these are natural. Uh, natural blue and yellow, blue and gold macaw nests here in Miami, and their breeding season is starting now. So we've started installing cameras uh, on them, uh, so that people can log on and basically see their see the activities that they're doing on on basically live. Uh, so if you have time, uh, feel free to uh, log on to YouTube and look up uh, Miami macaw cam uh, live stream. And you'll see that you'll see one of our active nests at this point. We're super excited, super happy. Uh, one of the the first female actually laid its first egg uh, yesterday. Uh, so we're keeping our fingers crossed for it to be successful. Uh, we're hoping that she lays another egg in the next couple of days and we can see that transition from egg all the way into a flying a flying uh, chick. So feel free to uh, look us up on YouTube, subscribe and like the channel. We're, ba we're recently started, we just started last week, uh, but wanted to take the opportunity here to share uh, some of those findings because we're really committed to the education of, of this. Um, many people think that these are, um, invasive species and that they have bad effects on the on the native flora but really that has not been the case for the macaws the research that we have done does not suggest that they have a negative impact on the uh, native flora so yeah if you have the time go ahead and and, and you'll you'll have a lot of uh, a parrot drama that you can you can be able to look at from the commodity of your home so if yeah, that's the end of my, my talk for today. Thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Okay, thank you so much, Fabio. This was great. I'm sure we're gonna have a, a lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna start off with one question that comes up a lot with the parrots in Miami and the rest of Florida and really the rest of the country is right now they're not protected at all. So they're what's not. to stop a poacher from for example, going to this nest and just stealing the babies. There's actually no law against it right now. So are you aware of anything in your area, any movement towards protecting these birds? Unfortunately, there's, as you well mentioned, there's no uh, current laws protecting these birds. So what we're hoping is that by highlighting uh, their, the, their daily lives in the nest, but with the general public, we can sort of help the general public fall in love with these species and, and sort of spearhead some of the protection efforts. So far, we have been very successful with the, uh, with the city here. With, uh, we're in Coral Gable City, and we have had some several very productive meetings with them uh, to sort of uh, start promoting the direct protection of both the nests and the, and the uh, uh, wild macaws as birds uh, as well. But unfortunately, as you will mention, for the rest of the uh, species in Florida, there's no current laws uh, that are in place to protect them. So we're hoping to uh, start promoting education and highlighting the species and sort of opening the doors so that we can uh, eventually start protecting these wild birds. Hmm. 
Oh, and for everyone, um, Diane just posted the YouTube link in the chat. So I'll make sure I have a copy copy of that and send that to everyone as well. But um, thank you. Thank you. You might not, it's getting dark over here. So there, there might not be uh, a lot of activity right now, but if you log on uh, in the morning, you'll see the female. She started incubating uh, the egg yesterday. So you'll see her there in the nest and you'll see the male come in and feed her and all of that. Last week was pretty exciting because she was uh, building building the nest and the amount of preparation that she was, uh, she was going through was just amazing. Um, just cleaning and excavating yeah it was really fun to watch because that's not the tip the type of typical things that you're able to see with these wild birds is this a natural nest or an artificial nest no it's it's a natural nest yeah oh terrific yeah i'm sure that will be exciting to see um and going back to belize a moment um i i thought that belize has uh strong anti-poaching laws of course i know Laws like that are ignored all the time. But uh, is there any education in the area that uh, you were working in to try to get people to stop poaching? Yeah, unfortunately, it's a it's a it's a struggle for everyone. Uh, there, Belize has amazing biodiversity. Where I was just working with, um, I only presented here about the yellowheads, but we I was part of my team was also working with scarlet macaws as well. And uh, those are also in, under direct threat from poaching. And what's pretty interesting with the macaws is that unfortunately uh, for Belizeans, macaws are a, a, a no-go. They are super proud of them. Uh, they don't poach them at all, but the birds are nesting very close to the border with Guatemala. And what they have is that Guatemalans will, clo will um, cross over the border to poach the birds as well. Um, so that's... Uh, that's uh, one mm -hmm. of the main challenges there. While I was there, uh, I was working directly with uh, schools on educational programs, sort of visiting them and showing, uh, showing them pictures and, and kind of making them aware of the threat of poaching. It's a, it's a hard battle to fight. Um, these people um, have been seeing poaching for a long time and it's, it's sort of a normal thing for them to have a pet. Um, and unfortunately, what we wanted to achieve was to ch the change in mentality of first, uh, thinking that these, these pets that you now have are actually coming from the wild. So you're having a, a direct effect on the breeding populations in the wild. And also sort of in, increase the life quality for, for some of these birds because the conditions in, the, in which they were kept were really not the best. And many of, a lot of these actually comes from just a lack of knowledge. Um, they were being kept in small cages. They loved them to death, but, but they were not being kept in the best conditions just because they didn't know how to properly care for a parrot. So it's also one of the programs that uh, Belize Bird Rescue started over there is just uh, an educational outreach program to um, basically improve the living conditions of some of these parrots as well. And that it, it's been a slow change, but steadily uh, we, we're seeing now the commitment of people on, first of all, keeping in, improving the welfare of their birds and also just the um, being conscious of where, where these birds are actually coming from and now saying, no, I don't want the bird. I'd rather see it flying in the wild. So that's that's been a beautiful change that we that we have been able to see. Yeah, Belize, Belize Bird Rescue is terrific. We we had them talk to us a year or two ago, and uh, amazing. Yeah, Belize has been making great strides in um, getting people to appreciate the birds in the wild. And uh, yeah. we, I think they they shut down their zoo right so that all the bird all the animals would be. Um, reintegrate into the wild as best they could. Yeah, yeah. We have a question about this this nest in particular, the macaw cam nest. About looks like it could fill with rain drowning the chicks, and does it have natural drainage? Well, one of the the macaws are smart. <laughs> one of the things you you can't see it from the picture, but one of the things that the females started doing is that she basically started opening some drainage holes. Uh, close to the bottom of the uh, of the chamber itself, so she she spent a lot of time opening uh, little small holes that would uh, help with the drainage of that. 
And then it's also on a, on a palm tree. So all of it on the inside is really, really fibrous. And what happens is that the raindrops just go through with the fiber. It's not really absorbed. It just goes down. So it's never, uh, it's never flooded on the inside. So they're, they're smart with, with the substrates that they're, they're selecting to nest. <laughs> yeah, that's terrific. I, I wonder if that's why we, I think there are a lot of parrot species that use palm trees to nest. Yeah. Yeah, there are. It's also, palm is also very soft, so it's easy to modify the nest to um, your, your particular specification. Yeah, to, to, to whatever your, you need, to whatever you need. Yeah. Excellent. Unfortunately, being, being soft also makes them um, not the longest lived. So the longevity of some of these nests is not really that much. Uh, they'll be around for roughly four or five years, but then uh, the effects of rain and wind just kind of blow them down. So that's sort of a trade-off uh, with when you're using these nests for for reproduction. Now, is it as with most parrot nests that some some other animal had to have created the hole in the nest first, and then they modify the inside? Yeah, for not for these guys, uh, the Amazons in Belize, they were dependent on other birds creating the, uh, the original hole or just natural breakage from uh, wind or rain and decomposition. Uh, all of the macaw nests that we're finding here uh, have been uh, lightning strikes <laughs> on, the, oh. uh, on the palm, yeah. So that's super interesting. Uh, it takes a while for the palm to fully decompose so the birds can use them. Uh, but whenever we speak to the owners of the areas, they tell us that, yeah, the palm, uh, it was basically killed by a lightning strike. And within a couple of years, it started rot um, hollowing out. And just like that, the macaws came in and, and did the rest of the um, remodelations. Oh, isn't that interesting? I, I could be wrong, but I think I read recently something about lightning strikes and that Florida was number one in the nation for lightning. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, know I, this. I could be wrong, but I, th I think it was Florida. And that, that's kind of interesting that that would then be creating lots of extra nest sites for the birds. That's interesting. And well, there is predation into these, into these nests by snakes and other animals. Say again? There's predation. Is there predation into these palm tree nests by snakes well, and other animals? We don't know yet. Uh, we don't. That's one of the what's. That's one of the things that we hope to see uh, from the cameras is who are the main predators for uh, for some of these nests in Belize. It was basically everything was out there to to get them. We had snakes, uh, woodpeckers, uh, rats going into the nests. Um, other parrots, we found, uh, this is a cool story, we actually found that uh, birds that were close, uh, nesting close to each other were fine with each other being neighbors as long as they were both successful. If one of the nests failed, then the failed pair would go over into their neighboring, uh, into their neighbors and basically just kill their chicks. Um, Oh. So what we think was happening is that they're actually um, in, in the mind of the failed pair, they were they sort of shifted from from breeding birds into territorial birds and just went over there to claim that cavity that in their eyes thought that should have been them. So it was it was really interesting to see that, that you know, the birds were fine with each other as long as they were both being successful. But the moment one of them failed. It was a switch within within 24 hours. They were already visiting the other nest and basically destroying either the eggs or the chicks when they were there. And they were brutal. Those attacks were brutal. We had a couple of them on camera and yeah, it was really sad to watch, but you, you can't intervene. And these are same, the same species, right? The same species, yeah. Wow. The well, that's certainly species. not good for the survival of the species. <laughs> I know, I know. I wish they knew that they were endangered. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it. When I heard Mauro talk last time about the situation between the toucans and the highest sense, uh, which, which is something I'd never heard about, and was very bizarre, but also, but very interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, feel free to, to talk about it. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what part of uh, what Mauro was mentioning, but the part I'm familiar with is, are you referring to the change of, of size in, in the fruits? No, it, it was he was talking about how the toucans predate on the hyacinth macaw chicks, but the uh, the maca the they also um, uh, there was something to do with the fruits that they because of them the fruits were available for the hyacinths to eat. So without the toucans, the hyacinths couldn't survive, but the, the hyacinth chicks were also food for the two kids for the two kids yeah yeah uh, i don't think i have read that research but i have read the uh an, a different part of research that he did with uh two kids in which he started comparing uh plant populations in areas where the two kids were present and areas where the two kids were not present uh and because the two kids are the larger frugivores when you remove them, basically the plants just started reducing this, the size of their fruits. Um, and, and you would think, oh, well, that's great. The plants are adapting. But then when you tested the germination and the uh, vigor of those smaller seeds, it was just, it was just the germination rate was really small, really low. And the vigor of those new, uh, new sprouting plants was nothing compared to the plants that had actually been dispersed by the toucans. Right, and those were, they, they were actually responsible for the fruits that the hyacinths ate. So without the toucans, the, the hyacinths were not getting the food that they needed, but the toucans were also eating baby hyacinths. So it was sort of a, a delicate balance. Yeah, yeah. But what I didn't know until you mentioned it I, I had no idea that a woodpecker would eat a baby parrot. Yeah, um, only when they're small, they'll eat the eggs and they'll take the, uh, they'll take the chicks as well. Uh, some of the larger chicks, as you saw in the video, no one, <laughs> no one can take those. Uh, but the, the, smaller, the smaller eggs, uh, well, the eggs and the smaller chicks, they, they really go for them. And for the eggs, they just drill a little hole and you can see them just licking, licking the inside of the, uh, of the egg. And then for the, uh, uh, for the young chicks, they'll just take them whole. That's amazing because I don't, I don't think woodpecker, I've never heard of a woodpecker doing that up here. Our woodpeckers don't normally take baby birds. Now mm -hmm. other birds like our blue jays, blue jays, crows and that, they will eat, uh, um, chicks in the nest mm -hmm. and I guess you know pretty much anybody will eat an egg but um, I, I've never heard of a woodpecker up up here eating a baby bird mm -hmm. yeah as I mentioned before everything was out to get them <laughs> <laughs> everything was out to get them but the reality is without humans they would be doing just fine because it's all all part of the the circle of life and the ecosystem but but we're the major perturbation to the ecosystem yes yes unfortunately yes that's yeah. that's the case yeah it was it was always a a struggle finding the balance in the field when um you know you, you we were seeing some of these interactions take place right in front of our eyes um i remember this one time we were walking up to a nest and uh we actually saw the uh they're, they're called tyras. It's like, a, it's like they're in the weasel family and they're a really large weasel. And we saw it um, climbing up into the nest and uh, we all knew what was coming, but, you know, we couldn't intervene. It's, it's, it's a circle of life. You know, if we were um, the, the rule that I sort of had for the rest of the team, you know, if it's, if it's an issue that we we are creating in terms of if you see someone that's out there trying to actively poach chicks or destroying nesting sites, then we would intervene. But if you're if we're talking about natural predators or other uh, parrot species intervening, then uh, we're just here as um, as viewers. You know, we're not directly acting on on those. So that's got to be very hard, very hard part of being a field biologist. It is hard. It is hard. Yeah. 
it's it's hard finding that balance. Did you ever have to confront a poacher? We had a couple of times. Um, I I was not directly um, the one confronting because I didn't want to expose myself or the team. Uh, many of the many of the times we were out by ourselves walking around in the savanna, so. Um, the poachers typically come in uh, to take parrots, but they're, they're fully armed because if they see a, a deer or a, or a paca, they're also going to go for that as well. And it doesn't, it's not particularly smart to start uh, trying to fight someone that's armed when you're not armed because we were not armed in the field. Um, but I was part of the team <clears throat> that would go in uh, to take the nestlings that had been poached. Um, I was not in charge of patrolling the areas and keeping the, the poachers away, but I was part of the team that would go into the areas where the chicks uh, that had been poached were uh, to basically take them out and either take them to Belize Bear Rescue or just put them back in a wild nest. Mm -hmm. right. uh, do we have some questions out there? Feel free to jump in or to type in the chat if you'd like. Hi, it's, it's Diane from uh, the Long Island Parrot Society. I happen to have the YouTube channel up and the macaw did get off of the egg and he or she crawled out. So I'm just staring at the egg. Do you know if that's a soft base where the egg and the bird sit? It is a soft base. It's actually really dusty. Okay. Um, yeah, so as, as I was mentioning earlier, she's been biting hard on all the fibers around the palm tree itself, and she starts excavating. It's really funny because you would think that they are not good at it, but given their short little, their short legs, but boy, she's strong. Yeah. <laughs> she's got some strong legs. So she started, She what she would do would be bite the... Uh, all the um the fiber of the palm and then she'd start excavating to mix the new material with the old material and it, yeah it all seems very very soft material inside of it right because i noticed when she was climbing out she used her wings first to i guess wedge herself up and then her feet took over and she was sitting on the top for a long time i could just see her tail and now she's gone Mm -hmm. So I don't know, do you know how long the, the, the egg would be sitting there by itself? I don't know because she uh, just she just laid it yesterday. So we're we're not sure if uh, this is a new pair or if she knows what she's doing and we're just watching. I know that for the Amazons uh, in Belize and the same thing goes for many of the Puerto Rican parrots, they start incubating after the second egg has been laid. Um, I don't know if it's the same thing for macaws. We're thinking that she's going to be laying two because we've seen other nests with uh, two eggs in them. Um, but yeah, we're, we're waiting for that second egg to see if she actually starts staying in the nest. Right, yeah. And um, getting back to Puerto Rico, am I wrong if I say it's illegal for Puerto Ricans to own a Puerto Rican Amazon? Yes. No, you're right. You're very right. Uh, I forget the specific number of the fine right now, but I think we're looking at roughly 20, 20 grand for uh, owning a Puerto Rican Amazon. Wow. But, but then again, it's legal in Belize for, 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 for citizens of Belize to own their own indigenous parrots. It's illegal, but it's not enforced. Or, or it wasn't, tra traditionally, it was not strictly enforced. Okay. Yeah. I got the impression from Blee's Bird Rescue that they are enforcing it now. Yes. And one of the things that Nikki uh, from Belize Bird Rescue uh, sort of put in place was this, um, this banding project of, because, you know, many of these birds have been with, with some of these families for, for years, you know, where you're looking at birds that are more than 15, 20 years old. And when you think of rehabilitating a bird that, that's this age and that knows nothing about the wild and all it knows is to speak and eat tortillas and eat corn, uh, it's, it gets really hard. So what they started implementing was just going out into some of these areas and putting a hard deadline 
okay, we are going to be able to register your para until this date, and anything past this date is going to be considered uh, a newly poached bird and that would be kept illegally. So what they developed was a basically a nationwide record of, of banded birds uh, that belong, you know, if, if Fabio wanted to, if Fabio had its own parrot for, for 10 years, he would take it over to Belize Bird Rescue. They would band it with a specific um, uh, code and then they would keep a record. Okay, Fabio has um, the yellow, a yellow-headed Amazon with band number number 10 and he's the rightful owner of this bird. He cannot sell it. He cannot uh, transfer it to someone else. He is the only person that's able to have this bird. And then if a couple, if next year someone comes in to see me and they find uh, another bird, then they would know, okay, Fabio doesn't have permission to have this bird. This bird that was either poached or um, bought illegally, what are the legal repercussions of this? Well, what would happen if you died then and the bird needed to go to somebody? I else? think, I, I don't know those details, but you you would have the, uh, I think that you had the option of either surrendering it to uh, Belize Bird Rescue or having a family member uh, take over the uh, the care of the bird. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it, Belize sounded to me to be more progressive on this issue than than obviously a lot of other places. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm interested to know, um, I didn't quite follow you when you were talking about native foods and non-native foods. What were the native foods? I mean, they preferred the native foods, is that correct? Are you talking about the macaws? Yes. Okay. Yeah, one of, one of the things that we wanted to basically, uh, uh, very general belief here in Florida is that the macaws are invasive and they have negative effects on both the flora and the fauna. So kind of a side project that I have right now is to feed them and give them the option of either native or non-native fruits to see what they consume. And if they consume it, what's the effect of that? And what we have found so far is that they don't really have a preference for either one, but when they consume the native fruits, they will actually help the germination rates of those uh, fruits. Why doesn't it help the germination of the non-native fruits? It's it's it it helps them either way. It's just that they have a preference for they don't really have a preference, but they're um, consuming. Sorry, I mix it up. They're consuming more of the natives. But the uh, germination rate, it's, it's the same for both uh, native and non-native species. When you say native, you mean native to Miami or? Na native to Miami, yes. But of course, a lot of the plants in Miami are also found in Central America as well. So the some of those plants would be their actual native plants in their, their native distribution, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? This uh, was very, very fascinating. Thank you. Appreciate it. You did a very nice job. Well, thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. It's lovely okay. talking to you all. And I think Maro had also mentioned how, you know, we saw those pictures of the giant tortoises uh, early on in your talk and that the, uh, the Galapagos, the famous Galapagos tortoises actually came from this area originally. And uh, we, we think they floated on, on native grass rafts or something. Yes, is, yes. That's strange given how heavy they are that they, they would have made it you know, all the way out into the yeah. Pacific without sinking. I think that what happens is that uh, you end up with juvenile individuals that are probably on the smaller end uh, because I really have a I have a really hard time seeing how one of those larger Galapagos tortoises would be able to cross, um, uh, yeah, cross the ocean into and colonize some of these islands. So, it's we're probably looking at juvenile um, tortoises that were able to colonize these areas, and, and they just happened to end up on rafts of 
vegetation that just happened to end up in the Galapagos. It just, well, it may not have been many. It could have just been a few. And yeah, yeah. they spread out to the different islands and then evolved into the different, the different um, tortoise species. Yeah. Again, I mean, you have to think we're always, we're always bound of thinking of, of time in terms of our definition of time. But, you know, this, this thing can be, can live up to be 150 years old. And if you get, if you get a, a, a dispersal event every 20 or 30 years, then by the end of it, you end up with a, with a pretty good founding population for, for the Galapagos to, to start their own species of tortoise. Right. And I didn't really spend that much talking uh, time talking about the tortoises because that's not really part of my project. But my colleague Sogmin, he's the one in charge of uh, basically feeding the tortoises and the and the iguanas, and he's been conducting. I sort of take over the role on the bird side, and he's taken over the role on the uh, tortoise and, and iguana side. So, um, yeah, he's he's been finding some really interesting stuff in terms of. Uh, preference for um, coloration as well, um, in which many of the many of the fruits that are consumed by the birds are typically uh, colored colored either uh, red or black, and then many of the fruits that are consumed by the uh, tortoises and the iguanas are either uh, yellow, orange, or just brown. So they're not really particularly uh, colorful, uh, while the, the, the fruits and seeds that are consumed by some of the uh, bird species are really bright in coloration. So it kind of sounds like you really need the reptiles and the birds together to make a full ecosystem. You need the whole deal. <laughs> so, you know, there are there are many, many, many islands in the Caribbean, and there are a lot of uninhabited ones, like the Bahamas, I think, has something like 100 islands, and um, there are a lot of them that are totally uninhabited. Do you ever foresee a time when, when the arrangements might be made to take one of these little uninhabited islands and use it as a living laboratory to see if you could rewild these species and rewild some of the original uh, vegetation? That would be the dream. Uh, that would be the dream. Unfortunately, we haven't, um, we haven't gone there yet because we're trying to sort of build the evidence from the ground up. Uh, the idea is basically to, by the end of this project, sort of have a better idea of what's the effect of these species. Can we use any proxies? Can we use the, um, the parrots or some of the non-native iguanas to substitute uh, those relationships, or do we really need uh, the native species that are no longer found there? So, yeah, it's it also gets very it gets tricky because when when you start bringing the idea of reintroductions and, and reintroducing species that might be exotic into different areas, people tend to be very very wary of these ideas. So we're trying to, instead of just going head on with, with the idea of let's start reintroducing species in the Caribbean, we want to sort of build the evidence of this is what we're missing. These are the potential solutions. How can we then approach these solutions in a way that everyone's, everyone's happy with them? I guess people are a little bit wary ever since Jurassic Park came out. <laughs> yes, yes. There's many examples across the Caribbean of reintroductions of, of introductions of exotic species that just didn't go well. Well, I mean, even here in the U.S., we had the reintroduction of the thick-billed parrot, one of only two native species to our country in uh, uh, I don't know if it was Texas or Arizona, and the reintroduction Arizona. was, yeah, it was a spectacular failure, and all the birds died, so, yep. and yep. that, that was their native habitat not too long ago, so. Yep, yep, I actually, a uh, little fun fact, I worked in, I worked in New Mexico uh, for a little while, and I had the opportunity to work in one of the last areas where they found one of the thick billed parrots from that reintroduction that just wandered away and ended up in New Mexico. And I was working in the ranch 
where that bird was found and eventually found dead because it was just by itself and couldn't find any food. Right, right. Yeah. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, then I want to thank everyone for coming. And Fabio, this was a terrific talk. We learned quite a bit. Um, and uh, I'm really glad that you were able to talk with us tonight. And I'm going to turn off the recording.